Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Sam Frayan. Um, my colleague, uh, Kirky DeLong, and the rest of the team of JOL uh, um, would love to welcome you uh, as well uh, for this session. For this session that's called, that's named Tips um, from Teachers on Engaging Students in Live Sessions and Asynchronous Discussions. Uh, we're joined here by a fantastic uh, group of teachers that are experienced in, in teaching online as well as uh, in person uh, and also in, in education research, both online and in person. Uh, we're all in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, you might, every now and then, you might hear my kids in the background. They're going crazy. Um, we suddenly found ourselves having to... to uh, stay indoors, uh, work remotely. We're all kind of working remotely here. Uh, uh, people from MIT and from other institutions have been working remotely for the last uh, 10 days or so. Um, we're all trying to adjust uh, to our new life. Uh, and as well, at the same time, a lot of the teachers are having to switch their teaching uh, uh, online over, literally overnight. Um, and trying to figure out how to do it. Um, there's a lot of good advice out there. Um, yesterday, I, I uh, looked up how to use Zoom on YouTube, and I found hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of videos to tell you how to use Zoom to teach. Uh, a lot of schools are setting up uh, websites um, to, um, um, to help teachers with resources. And the goal of this session is to hear from experienced uh, teachers uh, uh, that have had to go through that transition uh, under normal circumstances and, and really hear about some of the, uh, their best practices and have a discussion. Um, we will use the chat feature to post your questions. We'll hear from each one of the presenters for a few minutes and then um, uh, we'll uh, have enough time for questions and for discussions. I would like to welcome the panel. Uh, we have Mindy, Mindy Branson. Uh, uh, Mindy is a math teacher uh, from Mountain Heights Academy uh, in Utah. It's a premier online charter school. Um, she's uh, serving uh, students in grades seven to 12. Uh, before her online teaching, she taught in a title one brick and mortar role charter school for five years and had a stint working for an educational startup company, uh, assisting to develop an ed tech uh, training platform for teachers. Um, Mindy is passionate about utilizing technology to improve the educational experience, and, and we're very lucky to have her. Um, we'll also hear from Lucas Tambasco. Lucas is the professor in the Department of Computational Sciences at Minerva School at KGI. Um, he teaches the mathematical track over Minerva's online platform, leading small synchronous active learning seminars with around 18 students. Um, Lucas obtained his PhD at MIT and worked uh, with us at Open Learning uh, on several, several projects. Uh, we'll also hear from Megan Perdue, who's a digital learning fellow in the Digital Learning Lab at MITx. She works with MIT faculty in the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences. And she's very interested in, in researching, conducting experiments into the best practices, especially when it comes to uh, discussions online. Um, and lastly, we'll also hear from Dr. Glenda Stump. Uh, we, Glenda is, is, uh, is our favorite educational researcher here in open learning. She's worked at MIT for many years on various projects related to uh, uh, teaching, uh, research and teaching and learning, but as well as uh, uh, professional development for teachers, STEM education, active learning, and, and more recently, uh, developing uh, workforce. And we're excited to hear from uh, you, Mindy. I'll give you, I'll give you the floor. Hello and welcome. I am so excited to be here today. I want to thank Kirky and Safe for having me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and go from there. All right. So um, they gave you a little bit of information about my background, and I am. Uh, I've been teaching online for the last four years at Mountain Heights Academy. Like, like Safe said, my experience teaching online is probably very different than the experience you've had. I, I had a little bit of time to prepare myself for this uh, transition, but um, I'm just so impressed and amazed by what has been happening in education over the last couple of weeks. Honestly, it's been very inspiring. And so um, I, I saw this term, quarantine teaching, 
asking and I thought that was just kind of interesting just as these times are they're very strange and interesting and um <laughs> just want to welcome you to that this time so um let's see here and so I'm going to be talking about making the adjustment from working in a brick and mortar and teaching in a brick and mortar to going online. And first of all, I just want to say there's things that are different. There's things that are going to be the same and there's things that are going to just require a little bit of a shift in thinking. And so you're probably going through that right now if, if you've made this transition. But most of all, obviously, the blaring difference is that the social interaction is different. You're not seeing your stu students every single day in the classroom where you have a captive audience. It's, it's very different, especially if they're not showing up when you're having these live sessions and things. How are you going to reach everyone? So that's, that's very different. Um, your focus is shifting from classroom management and how you're managing those students working together and everything and to how you're managing those students that are working asynchronously. They're working alone, but you want to kind of still give them that social interaction. So it's very interesting as to how that changes. Um, I would say some of the things that stay the same, though, are the way that you teach, your teaching philosophy and your pedagogy. Those things don't have to change. And especially where you've had these students, if you're working in a K-12 like I do, you've had these students for three quarters already. Probably you're starting your fourth quarter, ending your third quarter at some point. Um, and so you probably already have some processes and things in place and I would encourage you to kind of keep those the same so that you have that um, opportunity to just continue that and it's already familiar to the students and it's comfortable to them. So keep as much as you can the same in your everyday while shifting it to this online setting. Um, and then I would just say that the things that happen that are kind of a shift in thinking are as you are creating your learning opportunities you are thinking of the processes not only as for you as a teacher but for your students how are your students going to access this information how are they going to interact with the information how are you going to interact with your students how are um, they going to end up submitting their their work so it's very it's just a change in how you have to consider all of the elements where some of those things when you're in a in a brick and mortar classroom just happen like they're just going to hand in the paper you know they're not going to do that online they're going to have to be able to take a picture or do something with their um, work and i and i'm an, i'm a math teacher so that does add another um, level of difficulty because we want to see their work but it's just interesting so um that's what i've been i've been monitoring a lot of chats on facebook and just saying like it's teachers are just, how am I gonna let my students write on their screen? Those types of things. So it is very different as to how it works in a brick and mortar. Um, and then I would just say some things that are, will help you to make a successful transition are consistency for sure. Um, adding a little bit of simplicity, keeping those same um, processes in place that you've already established in your brick and mortar classroom. And then utilizing your resources, definitely. So um, I would say that it helps if you can have consistency across some type of platform. If, if I mean, I know we can't control what happens in our schools and districts, but if, if there is an overarching school, um, like a consistent plan for uh, an LMS, like a, uh, you know, your learning management system, if you're using Google Classroom, if you're using Canvas, something like that, where everyone is using the same platform. So students don't have to learn three different things just to do their math, English, and science. You know, those are, that's really helpful. Um, if you are using one platform for like your video conferencing, so they can just learn Zoom rather than having to remember, okay, I'm Zoom, I'm going to Zoom for this class. I, this teacher uses Meet. Um, you know, there's just a lot of different things that happen and especially I mean even I'm a parent as well I'm getting all of these different emails and things from a lot of teachers because my student or my son is in eighth grade and so I'm getting he has seven different teachers and so I'm getting a lot of emails from all those teachers and it's overwhelming for me as well so I would say that the more consistent you can be across levels and even if it's just across a grade band um, it's going to be helpful for your student to understand what they're supposed to do and then I, just as far as the simplicity, like a consistent schedule, just making it as easy as possible. Don't try to use every tech tool out there. Um, use the tech tools that are going to be, get, get your uh, point across and get the, you know, do what you need them to do, but you don't have to use everything. And learn how to do them and learn how to do them well before you're introducing new uh, tools. 
And then lastly, just utilizing those resources. People are your greatest resource. Like I have been, like I said, I've just been super inspired by everyone who's asking questions and everyone who's willing to help and share their experience. It's just been so awesome. And so some of my sanity savers, I would say, are um, things that I will show you right now. So like I always sit with my back to a wall because then I don't have to worry about what's going on out here. I work at home um, with a two-year-old. And so there's always things going on around me, but I have my back to the wall. No one else can see what's going on here. And that's just super helpful. And just little things like that really have saved my sanity. Um, I, I clean off my desk at the end of the day, my desk. And my desk is essentially my inbox or my uh, desktop. I make sure that those are clean, that I know when I go into tomorrow and I open my inbox, those are the things that are that I have to get done. I, I have my chat available with my students and I, as I'm um, finishing my chats with my students, I archive them just so that um, I'm not missing anything as it is new and coming in. Um, and just setting up some healthy boundaries for yourself. Just really, I've seen that teachers are, are saying, I'm working until two o'clock in the morning every night and things like that. And I, I think at some point you just have to walk away. You have to be able to you know, walk away from your classroom, <laughs> AKA your computer. So close it, walk away, take some time outside, take some time with your family and do that. And then um, just a little, like something that I have done a lot is just communication tracking. So are you seeing those students? Like, are you seeing every student? And I'm sure that every, every school kind of has their own um, guidelines as to how they how much they would like you to interact with your students but are you seeing them if you're not maybe checking in one-on-one -on -one, um and just making a, a point to talk to each of your students at least once a week you know maybe not every day they probably don't want to talk to you every day unless you're in an elementary setting that's probably a little bit different but um in a junior high high school setting um you'll probably talk to them about once a week if not more and then um Honestly, after we're out of survival mode, I hope that we can see the good in all of this because I think that there are amazing things happening and we can see how to leverage some of these new skills that we're learning to uh, enhance our everyday teaching practices. So like I said, you are all amazing and I'm so inspired by everything that's been happening in education um, since this pandemic and since everything has been happening. So um, thank you so much for having me and I look forward to getting your questions. Thank you, Mindy. Uh, yes. Really appreciate sharing your experience and, and certainly like great tips for, for all of us. Uh, I love especially kind of making sure that we're all sane. Uh, you know, we have to stay sane as well as uh, care for our students and make sure that we're, we're in touch with them. Absolutely, that that's so important. Uh, we'll hear now from Lucas. Lucas will tell us about yeah. how, how he engages his students in his class. All right, hello. Oh, and I just got signed out. That So first thing, tech issues happen. But anyways, I think we're ready. Can everyone see the screen? So we'll go ahead and get started. So thank you again, Safe and Kirky, for having me. And um, as I talk, uh, a lot of the things I say are going to echo what Mindy were saying because they are the practices that have helped us through these past years teaching online. Um, I've been teaching at the higher ed setting uh, with Minerva schools at KGI and Minerva has had about seven years to think about this, to think about transitioning to an on fully online experience, right? So over these seven years, uh, Minerva has developed a platform uh, where we can uh, hold these online courses and thinking about research education and best practices to go online. I just want to make a note here, uh, like Mindy said, we're doing this over, you're doing this overnight and it might not be able, it, it's not realistic to implement all of these changes and all of these uh, education research overnight into your teaching. That's not at all what we want you to do. So our main goal is for you to have a, a transition from the brick and mortar to your online classes. As a very secondary goal, we want you to reflect on some of these practices that I'll bring up and see which ones are going to make sense uh, in your pedagogy. You know how you teach, you've been doing it for a long time. So you have experience. Some of the things I say might resonate better with you than others. Take those uh, uh, as, as the hints and again, as the secondary 
uh, objective as you transition online. A few of the things uh, that we, we have to keep in mind uh, the entire time is we need to let technology recede into the background. I know it's different not having your students in front of you. I know it's different being on an online platform. Um, it is helpful to acknowledge that to your students in the beginning. Look, it's a new setting. We all have to get used to this. Um, so it's good to set a few expectations. Again, not change your entire teaching philosophy and your entire teaching rules, but just set some expectations as basic as cell phones are still not allowed. <laughs> uh, Facebook uh, and, and other uh, online interaction uh, that distracts you from class should be avoided. And the other thing that we suggest is for you to avoid, try to so, avoid trying to solve all of the technological problems that arise. People will have connection issues. Technology won't work as expected, but you have to focus on maintaining the academic goals that you have for your class um, and for your students. With that in mind, I want to really dwell into that, into setting clear goals and outcomes for your students for every class session. Um, that way your students can anchor themselves in something, uh, something solid, something that they can look back, something that they can focus on. It's challenging to focus through all this transition, through everything that is going on. So as an instructor, I try to set goals that my students can clear, clearly relate and clearly see if they've accomplished or not. Also, if you decide to do some group work, uh, Zoom has breakout features. It's important to give clear instructions about what you expect your students to do. One general tip is not to just say, talk about math or talk about probabilities for 10 minutes. You might have people really interest, interested who have 10 minutes of probability to discuss. Some people will say, oh, probability is that, yep, yep, we're done. <laughs> we, we don't want that. We, we want some engagement from our students uh, as they go into this, this group work. Um, so you can have a moment of reflection at the end. So chats in, in, in these online platforms are very helpful because the students can sit, take a moment and reflect if they've achieved the goal that you set for them. If the learning, um, if the activity was helpful in achieving uh, that learning outcome. Uh, so these are minor changes that rely on basic features of the platform that might be implementable in the short term. Um, as Mindy said, having structure is really helpful and reassuring as you go through this transition. So having a simple outline of things you want to accomplish, setting those goals at the beginning, then asking a quick poll question, how do you do something? Uh, so quick multiple choice, having some activity to again, uh, try to accomplish that learning goal and, and give uh, concrete steps to reach those learning goals. And finally having that reflection at the end. This is just an example of structure that you can have. Um, I know people have different teaching strategies. Um, if you're used to a different teaching strategy, see how you can translate that into a structured um, presentation, into a structured class section uh, that you students can get used to. Again, do not reinvent the wheel. It's important to, uh, like, again, uh, re saying a lot of things that Mindy said, to try to make the class a community. Um, some ways that you can do that is to encourage mistakes. And mistakes can happen when you do a calculation, when you go through an argument. Um, it's important to create an environment where those mistakes are accepted. Um, other things that you can do are call your students by name, say hi to them as they walk into the platform, walk in in quotes, of course, um, and keep these activities that really engage the student. Student engagement with all the distractions around will be a tricky challenge. Um, so think about ways that you can actively uh, address that as you transition to online learning.
I'll talk very briefly about math. I, I teach uh, some of the mathematics course uh, at Minerva schools. And uh, one of the things I do a lot is that I have these slides and I have this whiteboard and I get, oh, this is me, don't worry. Uh, I get to write um, and ask students questions. So if you have an iPad or some kind of tablet, it really helps. A Zoom works well with these tablets. And then you don't have to worry about your students having to input math into the platform, but rather you can act as a scribe. So I can carry on a small exercise here. We'll talk about probability. And uh, Glenda, so I hear um, that you've been reviewing your probability. So we, we want to explore that. So if I want to compute the probability of a coin landing on heads, how would you introduce that concept? How, how would you calculate that probability? What's the probability that when I flip a coin, I get heads? So it could be either heads or tails. And so I would say that the probability would be one of two. One of two, right. So when we're trying to come up with a calculation probability and Glenda explained it very clearly, we had the total outcomes that were heads. So the number of uh, outcomes that were heads, which were one over the total number, so total outcomes. So Glenda did not have to write anything. Myself, with my technology, I can go ahead and write it for my students and have that going. Of course, there are many other tools like Desmos, GeoGebra, Wolfram Alpha, where you can do a lot of math online and share your screen and have this input output discussion with your students. So at the end, uh, I, oh, sorry. Uh, it's back here. Technology issues will happen all the time. Uh, so I'll just share some of the resources uh, that uh, you can take a look uh, either about uh, our platform at Minerva or the philosophy and the techniques we have used um, at Minerva thinking about transitioning online. So thank you so much. If you want to continue the conversation, I'll share the slides uh, and my email here. Thank you, thank you, Lucas. Uh, really great advice, and you know, especially uh, uh, thinking of of setting your goals, but making them simple. Have a simple flow for your class. Uh, make sure that there are some some activities. Uh, certainly, great advice. And and uh, I see a lot of people in chat asking questions. Please keep asking questions. We'll come to these questions uh, later. A lot of people are asking specifically about uh, how to engage in, in small group. Uh, discussions. Um, uh, also, many people are asking about recording. The, the, this this is going to be recorded. We will record the webinar and we'll share with everyone publicly. Um, so uh, next, we'll uh, we'll hear from Megan. Uh, Megan, I know that uh, over the last two weeks you've been working with faculty nonstop to help them figure out how to run their uh, their online sessions, uh, but you also have a lot of experience in, in uh, uh, running discussion, uh, asynchronous discussions, and, and uh, perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so hi guys. So I'm a digital learning fellow for the School of Humanities at MIT. So in that capacity, I've been helping the uh, humanities and social science faculty transition their classes online. Uh, I put together a big training program and guide. I'm just going to share that in the slides. It's very MIT specific, but there's a lot of uh, tips for Zoom if anyone's interested in that. Um, I just shared that in the slides. But today I'm going to talk about um, how to run asynchronous discussions. So I run a lot of classes on edX that are discussion based. And it's a little tricky to create a vibrant discussion-based class that is completely asynchronous and self-paced, but one in which you want to have engagement and back and forth discussion between students, even if it's taking place over the span of days or weeks. So I have, I've tried some different tactics and I've done a lot of research into what is the best practices for this. Um, and I'm just going to share five points that I've sort of come to rely on for doing this. Um, so my first point is, you're going to be checking your forums 
every day. So if you're doing discussion forums, you need to be present in the forums and model the behavior that you want to see from your students. Um, here you're going to be asking questions, keeping the conversation flowing. Don't just thank people for posting, but respond to their posts and think about, um, yeah, like how do you want your students to act and, and showing them through your actions. Um, I have like seven courses or eight courses on edX right now. I check all of them every day. I try to write five posts in each class a day. Um, so point two, discussion forums are not short essay papers. There's a big um, sort of trend in teaching to have your students post like short essays in these discussion forums, like write these two paragraphs and respond to this series of questions. But if you wouldn't ask these kinds of, if you wouldn't ask your students to discuss this in class, it's probably not the right avenue for a discussion forum because this is about creating conversation. It's not about a sort of academic exposition or proving points. So you want something that's going to be conversational um, and less essay. Point three, think about who, who owns the discussion forum. What language are you using to encourage students to post? Are you telling them exactly what to post and when and how they should be acting? Or are you letting them have some ownership over this space and giving them freedom to post what they would like or what they're interested in? Just think about, just kind of read through the language you're using and, and, um, and with an eye towards this. You could even think about if you have a smaller class, like I can't do this with my, uh, with my massive classes, but if you had a group of 30 or 40, you could even create these norms with your students. So sit down and talk with them and see what do they think the forums should be um, and what are they willing to participate in. Um, and you could kind of come up with a contract together. So point four, making sure you're alternating between a variety of these discussion prompt flavors. So I always try every week to have at least one post that's open reflection where I say something like, did you learn anything that surprised you this week? Or did we not cover something that you wished we had covered? Um, do you have any personal stories to share? Do you have anything that has come up that you'd like to reflect on in this space? Just giving them freedom to bring up whatever they want related to what we've learned this week. Um, then I have a lot of topic response posts where um, we're really, looking at the questions and lectures that we've covered in class and bringing up conversations specific to that. So that's kind of more compare and contrast these two stories, give an opinion about this case study, or uh, you know, pick a stance and defend it with data and kind of create debate situations, like things like that. The third kind is crowdsourcing content. So this is really useful um, for, accumulating like articles, outside resources, more case studies. This actually helps take the burden off of you, the instructor, to have to update your course every year. So you can ask students to find, you know, relevant articles that they want to post. So this makes it sure it's up to date that you're not having to go out every year you teach this course and, you know, update all of these articles and resources, but the students are engaging and participating and, and creating the course itself. Um, and expanding the content. And finally, thinking about respecting your students. So whenever I'm writing my discussion forums and putting my course together, I always sit and think about this statement. I believe that my students are intelligent, curious, and eager to connect intellectually. And then I think, are the discussion forums I'm writing consistent with that belief? Am I respecting my students' desire to learn and to connect? Or am I perhaps hindering it? And then how am I carrying through that belief with my grading and quotas? So sometimes it, you can think about, you kind of want to control how the students are going to be acting. Um, you want to make sure that you can measure their participation. Like, did they do 10 points? Or did they make one post and two comments? Um, I found that it it is, Best if you can just kind of release this. Think about grading forum participation, perhaps how you would grade class participation. 
Uh, I know often in class participation grades, we're not so hard quotas, like, yes, this student asked two questions in the first class and one question in the third class. It's kind of more general, like, were they present? Were they there? Did they show up? Um, so thinking about discussion forums the same way, but you want to create something that's not, it's not a box that the students are checking. This is like something they want to do. Like I've had students, I felt like I was really successful in a um, edX class. I had students telling me that they woke up every morning and they checked the discussion forums on their phone before they checked Facebook because they were so excited to see that what the other students were saying. So it's like, this is, this is what I want to see, like encouraging that this is a fun thing for them. Um, so that's, that's what I got on discussion forums and happy to take questions on this or on uh, our online response uh, at MIT and the humanities uh, at the end. Thank you, Megan. Uh, certainly th there's a lot of discussion on, on, you know, when we move things online, uh, some stuff is going to be synchronous, some of it is going to be asynchronous. So it's, it's, it's really great to, to, uh, to, to, to make use of, of the asynchronous tools. And, and um, I like how you talked about kind of setting the norms there, which is, which is something that everyone is kind of facing as a challenge. Um, now we hear from Glenda. Uh, Glenda is gonna give us some, some tips on, on how to engage students and how to get more feedback from them. Thank you, Safe. So we've heard some great recommendations and tips about getting started with classes online and about asynchronous discussions. I'm going to talk for a few minutes about a couple important points for engaging students in a synchronous setting. So most of us are looking for ways to actively engage our students in our sessions. Um, an important consideration when planning these active learning or planning activities is whether one person will be actively engaged in our all too familiar scene here where one person raises their hand and continues the discussion or whether we will engage all students. And this is important in any setting, of course, but I think we think about it um, now more than ever as our students are not with us and they can become easily distracted in their environment and we're not sure that they're really following along with us. So we try to plan activities that engage all learners. Anytime I think of something to do in a classroom, my first thought is, is will this be with one student? Will one student be answering me or paying attention? Or will I elicit a response from, from all my students? Um, and so I constantly think about how to, to cognitively engage all the students with what I'm doing. So one easy way or one excellent way to, to, to engage most of your students is with poll questions. And this was something that Lucas had mentioned earlier. Um, we use these weekly in an online session that we do in one of the projects that I'm currently working in. Um, you can do poll questions at varying levels of difficulty or with varying purposes in mind. You could do short, easy questions, like the ones that you engaged in when you um, signed on today, just asking where you were from. Um, and with students in a classroom, you might ask a yes, no question. Uh, you might ask them to recall something that they read in the assignment, or you could even ask them um, to recall something that you just asked, that you just told them. So you can do short, easy poll questions just to make sure that they're with you. Um, we actually use concept questions um, in our polls. So concept questions um, ask the learner to process information that you've just given them. Um, they're slightly more challenging, of course, than the ones that I talked about earlier. They ask them to use the information you've given them to reason, to solve a problem. And it's a great way to provide a mental break. If, you, you know, if you've done some talking, it's a good way to allow them to process some information and think about it a little bit. Some of the research and learning sciences have shown that practice at retrieving information promotes learning. And so concept questions are a quick, easy way to get, allow your students to practice at retrieval, you know, shortly after they've been given the information. 
So concept questions really serve two purposes. They allow students to recognize how much they do or do not understand about the, the topic or what you've been talking about. Um, and then they also allow you as the instructor to recognize how well students understand what you're teaching them. So if they're not understanding, you can slow down, you can give them more examples or allow them to work with the information in another way. So what are they? How do, how do we construct them? Typically, they focus on a single concept. They're not solvable by relying on equations. They have multiple choice answers. They're very clearly worded, and they're of medium difficulty. And here's an example of a concept question you can see. Um, this one comes from a resource written by Eric Mazur. You can find examples of concept questions all over the internet, um, which is really helpful. So how we present concept questions is really how we engage the students, right? Um, so the way that we do it, we try to engage as many people as possible. Um, we present the question and the possible responses first, and we do this via PowerPoint. Um, the learners then respond to the questions individually. And on many of the platforms that you'll encounter um, for online teaching, Zoom, WebEx, Adobe Connect, and I'm sure there are many others, have the polling function that you saw today, where students then, you play, put the poll up on the screen, and then students respond you know, on their computers or on their phones. Um, I've also used um, low-tech resources, and I think you can do this online as well. Um, when we're face-to-face, -face, I actually have students hold up a finger you know, looking forward, not looking around at anyone else, hold up a finger for the response that they choose, number one, two, three, or four. Um, you can have them do that in chat. Um, just say on the count of three, you know, I'm going to give you a few minutes to think about this answer, and on the count of three, everybody enter their response in chat. Okay, what is it? We then move on to um, small groups and we break the students into breakout rooms and have them talk about how they responded to the question and why they chose the response that they did. Um, we have group leaders for our groups and we have assigned permanent group leaders as we have stationary groups. Um, if, you have, if you randomly assign groups in one of the platforms, you can um, also spontaneously assign a group leader, the person whose name starts with the first letter of the alphabet or whose birthday is next, you know, some, uh, some uh, method like that. We have a group leader. Their job is to make sure that everybody talks. So they go around and make sure everybody reveals the answer they chose and provide some rationale as to why they chose that answer. When we return to the larger group, we then have, we further that discussion by asking learners to tell us what question that, uh, that they are, I'm sorry. We return to the larger group, I, back, I jumped ahead. We return to the larger group, the, the re learners respond to the question again, individually. And then we have the discussion by asking volunteers to explain the response that they chose. Um, and we do this for correct responses as well as incorrect responses. It's helpful for students to hear why a, a response is wrong as a, a, in addition to hearing why some responses are correct. In this, when we return to the larger group, you can see that this is, it becomes more of a one-on-one, -on -one, right? It's one person who's explaining why they chose a response. We then try to engage the rest of the group by asking, you know, how many of you agree with this response? Does anybody have anything else to add? Were there other reasons why you thought this response was right? You know, are there other reasons why this response is wrong? Soliciting engagement in that way. All of the chat um, functions, all of the, all of the uh, platforms have some type of an icon to represent um, agreement or disagreement. They have a thumbs up, a thumbs down, X's, check marks, something like that, that you can get students to respond or agree with whatever the student who volunteered to explain has said. So that we call method one. So we break out into small groups. Sometimes we have multiple um, poll questions or concept questions and we don't always do breakout groups. So method two is all learners stay in one group. 
we use the same initial procedure where we ask the learners to answer the question individually. Um, and then we go ahead and ask volunteers to explain the response they chose. Again, we ask for explanations or rationale for correct as well as incorrect responses. And then we engage the rest of the learners by asking who agrees, who disagrees, um, who has something to add, who has a different perspective, and, and continue the conversation that way. Um, after that discussion, then we ask everyone to respond to the question individually again. And then lastly, the instructor or the teacher can reinforce the correct answer and do any further explanation that might be needed. And then the last thing I want to talk about is um, getting feedback from the students and asking them to reflect on the session. We do mud cards um, at the end of every session, and you could do this at the end of every class. MUD stands is an acronym for most unclear discussion. Um, and it helps the students to, again, reflect on what they've just heard or just learned about, which is an important aspect of learning. These are anonymous. Um, I do them online through Google Forms. And I typically have three questions. The first one asks about what was the muddiest point for you today? What remains unclear to you after today's class? Um, I also ask what was the most important thing they learned and then allow them to make additional comments and you get lots of very valuable information from them um, in this additional comments section. Um, and I think the most important thing about mud cards aside from having them reflect on the class and, and think about what their question is, is the fact that you respond to those. Um, it's important to review their responses and then respond to those. If you use a, a platform like Google Forms, you can download all the responses in an Excel sheet. I typically collate those and respond to uh, the questions that you know, multiple people have asked or questions that, re that uh, relate to something that's very important um, where I feel there are many misconceptions. Um, you can respond at the next class. Um, I typically respond um, to at the next, if it's a workshop, I respond the next day. Some faculty, again, respond the next class. In the sessions, in the online sessions that I'm currently engaged in, um, we send online resources out to the folks, um, to the learners in response to their mud card questions. Um, we send out links to Khan Academy videos, to MIT's OCW material, um, sometimes to MITx courses, um, to the Colorado FETs, to um, the MIT Mathlets. There are plenty of resources out there that you can utilize that would give either visuals or further explanation um, for important concepts. And I think the, the responding to um, gives, that, gives that sense of community. Um, as other uh, panelists have mentioned, these are, are, are different times for students and building that sense of community, um, we have to work a little bit harder at to kind of get that closeness. And so when they give you that feedback and you respond to that, that's, that um, solidifies that, that community. So that's all I had to say for now. So we look forward to your questions. Thank you, Glenda. Um, so I'm going to start with some of the questions we got at the beginning of the session from Mindy. Um, so one of the questions, actually several questions were around, how do you begin a relationship with your students as you move online? How do you start that engagement? Well, um, at the beginning of each, uh, quarter or it, as I have new students come mainly my, the majority of my students come first quarter and then I have a few that come in throughout the year but mainly in first quarter um, I always do like a new student orientation type where I do have a live session with them and we interact and I kind of let them know the norms for the class and that and I record all of my live sessions so if students can't physically come to the live session, then they can still see it. And it's not as great as them being there, but it is still allowing them to have that, um, to see what's going on and not missing out on anything. So um, I would just say that that orientation is really great. And then just making sure that they understand how to contact me. A lot of students will come in and I'm dealing with um, mostly ninth and 10th graders. Um, but they'll come in and they don't really know what to do. Like we still have some technology things where they're like, I don't know, like, um, should I, should I uh, 
email you every time? Should I chat you? You know what I mean? And so I, I make sure that they, like, it's a requirement that they send me a chat. It's a requirement that we chat back and forth a little bit and we have that conversation so that it becomes more comfortable for them and that they understand kind of how, how the classes run. And I just make sure that they kind of have an idea of what they're supposed to do next, because there is a lot of ambiguity when they first enter the courses. Um, so, and I think just making them comfortable with coming to me is a big deal. Um, in, in my setting, students have, students signed up for this life. You know what I mean? It's a little bit different than the students that are just being thrown into it. So they, they understand. And a lot of them, a lot of them are coming to me for different reasons. And, um, many of them, you know, seek an online education for a specific reason and they don't want that inter interaction. So that's something that I kind of have to build as well with them and making them comfortable with working with me and with working with other students. So it's, it's tough. And the first, I would say the first two or three weeks is really just a lot of work on my end, trying to um, form that relationship with the students, trying to make them comfortable with me and with the course. Thank you. Lucas, did you want to add something? Yeah, I was just going to add that. Uh, so I've been doing it for a while and I've been amazed at how close I have been with my students. Uh, perhaps closer than I've been with brick and mortar students. And that's because, again, thinking about student engagement and active learning in the class, you're calling on your students, you're on first name basis, you're interacting all the time. Um, and then you have office hours, students can come and a lot of times they do and they're like, hey prof, what do you do for fun? Or <laughs> some, some questions like that that have nothing to do with uh, academics. So there is a possibility of developing connections with students and peers, even in an online setting. So we had a follow-up question from Mindy about the ramifications of student privacy when you record your sessions and post them. How do you handle the student safety and privacy issues? Well, I. Um, we, we just post them in our online um, in the course and so it's not it's uh, we honestly haven't had any issues with it and it's just something that is done across the board because we have to um, and I guess in my in my specific class and in, in the classes that we have at Mountain Heights Academy we're not so much I'm not so much calling out on a student and saying you know like like really giving the, you know like they're offering some feedback and things but I'm not I don't require my students to um, participate, I guess. Like I'm not, I'm not forcing them to, especially with math, because I feel like it's less, like they're already a little bit uncomfortable with the subject a lot of times. And so um, we really haven't had any issues with that, but I think, it, I think that that is something, uh, another one of those things like I talked about that is more of a school norm. This is something everyone at my school does. We record the sessions as an equity thing more that, so that everyone can access it at different times because we have students that work. We have students that are part-time students that go to Mountain Heights and go to another school, brick and mortar, when you know brick and mortar was happening. Um, so we haven't really had that issue. Um, we had a question for Lucas. It said, my students express what they, that they prefer video lessons rather than Zoom sessions. What do you think? How do you convince them of the importance and fun to interact in these virtual lessons? Right, so the question about what to do synchronously versus what to do asynchronously is a big one. It's something that uh, we have to decide. And given the transition, <clears throat> it's a good time to to start giving some material that is completed asynchronously, like watching videos, <clears throat> like doing some exercises in class and coming to class for the discussion, coming to class for group work, for exploring those topics more deeply. So there will always be value to the live interaction, um, but some of the content delivery may be done outside. Again, if this is something that resonates with you. It's something that you can start incorporating. Uh, you can start incorporating into your classes as you transition to online learning. Give some material ahead of time and have these uh, dynamic in-class discussions with your students instead of lecturing, perhaps. Thank you. Okay, Glenda. We have a yep. Glenda. We have a question for you. Um, this person wants to know, how could you apply this with language classes? They teach Spanish and these students are just beginning to learn the language. 
Um, they also want to know how you could use breakout groups in this setting. Mm, I think I think breakout groups would be great for practicing conversation. Um, uh, smaller groups with students um, practicing back and forth would be more beneficial actually than a larger classroom. One of the beauties of the platforms that are out there now is that the, the co-host or the host can, can jump from breakout group to breakout group. So the teacher or the facilitator, and if you have TAs, if this is a, um, an upper level setting, if you have teaching assistants, um, can disperse themselves among those groups and, and kind of monitor or help out the conversation um, if need be. But I think that breakout groups would be actually ideal for, for conversational um, uh, English language or language learning, not English language learning in general. Okay, so I have a question. I have no idea who to post this to, but about practical or performance based classes, lab classes. How do you handle this in this new ongoing environment? Anyone? So I, in my presentation, there is a resource. Again, it's not my area of expertise, but a colleague wrote on how to transition to lab classes. So I would refer them to that. Uh, I think this is for a biology class. So if you have my presentation, you can link back to that. Um, in the last slide, it's called, you had to cancel your lab course, now what? Uh, again, not my area, but I encourage you to take a read at that and follow up and I can put you in touch with my colleague who wrote that. Thank you. Megan, we had a question for you about how much time on average do you spend managing and facilitating your forums every day and what sort of schedule do you keep? Yeah, so I usually do this the first thing in the morning when I'm like with my coffee, I look at my email and then I look at my forums. I'd say uh, most days I try to respond to some number of three to five posts. Like the last few weeks I've been so swamped with helping uh, faculty. It's, it's all I can do just to look at the forums and make sure there's no problems. So I'd say if I'm, if I'm checking for problems, uh, it takes about 20 minutes. If I'm actually responding, it can take like 40 minutes. Thank you. Okay, so we have a question about office hours and how do you set up and run office hours? Um, Lucas or um, Mindy, either one. Um, I can just speak to that. So at our school, we have kind of an overarching plan for office hours. And that is really just, um, we have four office hours a day for full-time teachers. And uh, we, in, at the top of our course each week, we just have a, a link posted um, and that our office hours change each week, but we have them posted on, on at least by Sunday and that's for the whole week. And so you know what's going on. And then a lot of teachers can, will like just add to it and say next week, my office hours will look like this. So um, they know where to access them every, every day. Um, and it's just, of there but they are changing and i i try to model my office hours around my students availability so if i know i have a lot of students that are part-time students that have jobs or whatever i try to have a few office hours in the afternoon and a few office hours in the morning kind of dispersed throughout the week so that i can kind of meet everyone's needs the best that i can and i usually do a poll at the beginning of the quarter to just see hey you know when when do you think you'll be working on math when do you feel like um you know my office hours would be helpful to you. And then I always, when, when students reach out to me to meet, I'm always office, offering my office hours and then I off, offer to set up appointments outside of office hours if necessary. Right. I'll, I'll just echo most of those things. Uh, just in terms of platform, an empty Zoom session can work. You can bring up a whiteboard. You can have students join in and have discussions. And I'll second the idea of private appointments because sometimes you will set this one hour slot, no one will come. So encourage students to, to set specific appointments. And we also communicate through email, uh, Slack, or whatever uh, communication tool you're used to. Uh, so those are some good tips for office hours. Okay, 
So from Mindy and Lucas, we have another question about what do you do about students who do not want to do the activities or do not participate at all? I personally don't push them. I want it to be a comfortable space for them. I want them to feel like they can come to the session. Like I said, I teach math and I already know that there's a little bit of uncomfortableness with them. But that being said, also I teach an honors class and I do have a little bit of an expectation for my honor students that are a little that's a little bit separate than my regular ed students just because um, I feel like the honor students they they are comfortable with the content a little bit more and they do so I do have a little bit of different expectations but I don't like to put anyone on the spot I don't like to make people uncomfortable um, like I said they are seeking an online education at, at my school specifically and um, there are a lot of underlying things that go with that so I just want to make it a comfortable space for them but I do encourage them to participate and if they if they're coming a lot but they're not participating I might have a conversation with them outside of the session and just say you know even just set them up and just, just for something that they're comfortable with, I'm gonna ask you this question. And so that they can participate and they can see what that feels like and that it's not as scary, but encourage that participation and it's going to look different for every student is what I would say. No, I think that is uh, great of tailoring the level of questions that you ask uh, to each of your students um, as you get to know them more, you can push them a little bit more and as a college professor I get to be a little bit more mean than Mindy so uh, I can I can uh, ask them to participate uh, we can create a culture of participation oops I think someone started screen sharing let's let me stop that uh, so uh, as as we create a culture if it happens every day if every single student is saying something at every one of my classes it becomes the norm uh, and it becomes natural. I know it's a transition. We're not asking you to change everything tomorrow and get everyone, all oh, your 300 students, which is, that's not the expectation. But if you can create a culture of uh, raising hands and, and getting uh, students to participate, uh, I think it's a good culture uh, to implement. Yeah, and I'll, <clears throat> I'll add to that. Um, there are a fair amount of students, particularly in post-secondary, who are, are what we call lurkers on, in the MOOC world, you know, that they go and they, they listen and they read the discussion forums and they listen. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean they're not processing the information. I mean, when we talk about active learning, you know, we're all about interactive engagement, engaging and, and speaking and, and putting that information into terms and that helps us learn. But I think we also have to realize and appreciate that some people do that, just not publicly. So uh, while I totally agree with Mindy and Lucas and saying that we, we want students to engage and because it makes a lively class and I, I think they learn better, um, we have to also appreciate the students that it, it just doesn't seem to work for. Yep. Okay, Glenda, we have a question um, about body language. A big challenge we are now facing on the online teaching community is that we can't see the body language and there are misunderstandings and student alienation can result. How can we prevent this? That is a great question. <laughs> um, I, 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 I under, and I understand totally. I mean, if we're, if we're here with just our names and not our pictures, and I'm not sure if people are using video or not, I would assume that if you have a, a huge class that video is not an option, um, it becomes an issue to understand how, you know, how students are presenting very much as it is when we text or when we, you know, write emails. And so this may be something that, you know, one of the things you might want to talk about at the beginning as, you, as you're sort of setting expectations that, you know, we're only seeing what you write so let's proofread you know make sure that when we write something that it, it, it gets our point across and then that open open atmosphere or that open communication atmosphere expectation that you set I think is important here too because you know it will encourage people to say wait I didn't quite understand what you meant by that or ask encouraging them to ask you know to, to clarify what what's being said I think is important as well Emojis help. I don't know if those are considered appropriate <laughs> in, in various settings, but they seem to be really helpful in getting across the way uh, we feel about things as well. Um, any comments from anybody else? 
Okay, so we had another question about um, timing of classes. Do you find that a 60 minute class in a brick and mortar setting coincides with a 60 minute online class? How do you keep students attention knowing they have multiple things going on around them? From my experience, the, the online delivery of instruction will be different and, and like we were discussing, the synchronous time will be different from the traditional brick and mortar classroom. So that is why I suggested in my previous answer to think about moving some of that deli content delivery uh, before class, uh, right? So those 60 minutes that you do have with the students, they can be more engaging and they can be about answering questions um, and doing activities. But it, it does take more time uh, to, to implement some of, of these activities uh, than you would in a just delivering content in a brick and mortar uh, scenario. Again, for student engagement, I, I think we've been uh, throwing around some some ideas with uh, polls and mud cards and reflections and activities like that. It, it's hard to keep the students uh, paying attention all the time. You do your best to set the expectations and and carry that throughout the rest of the semester and throughout the rest of your online teaching career. Expectation, expectations are very important. Yeah, and I was just going to add to that. Everything seems to take longer. You know, when you put students in breakout groups, it takes a good minute or two to settle down, right? Um, but that is less than actually in a face-to-face -face classroom. It takes way longer for students to settle down in a face-to-face -face classroom. Um, but it does just seem to take longer. And that's where, you know, having some of those discussions and getting students to really engage deeply in the material sometimes is more effective than all of, you know, uh, a lecture about it or you know some of the, the things that we might think of otherwise. Thank you. Um, we're almost out of time but I'm going to ask a couple more questions. Um, this is open to anybody. How do you help teachers um, face the start of having to plan online instruction for the last few months of a school year? How do you set realistic goals and uh, mappings and endpoints. Any tips you have? It's a hard question. One thing that uh, I've been helping faculty with that's really helpful is just to think about strategically reducing your goals. So you had a plan for your semester in person and now there's been this disturbance. You might have students who get sick or their families get sick um, and they might not be able to participate in the second half of the class. So just think about like what are the key learning goals that you really like what are the core learning goals of your class that are crucial for your students to learn and like how can you focus on those and how can you perhaps build some off roads um, for students to be able to participate like asynchronously or if they have to disappear for a month is there a way for them to still be able to like continue learning but maybe just not uh, hitting like the full load that you had planned for the semester. So last question is about breakout groups. There's a whole bunch of questions about great, great breakout groups and how to use them appropriately. But the other question came in is how do you or do you have any suggestions on how to support the conversations in breakout groups seeing as you can't be in all of them at the same time and given that you can't see the interaction in each of the break groups as it's progressing, how do you support this and how do you engage with it? Any suggestions? I'll talk briefly about how I've supported it in the past. Um, we've actually, beyond doing what we're doing now, as I said earlier, was we've assigned a group leader and that group leader simply engages everybody by saying, you know, what was your answer? What was your answer? Why did you choose that answer? So that's their assignment. Um, in past sessions, though, I've actually scripted it a little bit more, um, where I've given the group leader a script to, you know, first do that, talk about why you chose, in the case of a poll question, why you chose the answer you chose, but then gave them some lead-in questions, like explain how you thought about that, or um, can you tell me what what might 
what might support your explanation? You know, just some, and it does have to fit the scenario. Um, and where I used them before, it wasn't with poll questions, but it was with um, in-class activities that they had to just discuss. And so, as Lucas mentioned earlier, you don't tell them to just go discuss. Like you had to give them some some structure to that. So I had a. Um, uh, everybody had a table leader, they called it, and they had a, a mini script that was the dedicated toward their question where they had uh, uh, prompts to, to lead the discussion. Um, in terms of monitoring it, I can only say that you could go to those rooms to monitor unless you had a note taker um, you know, in your group, but that seems to get maybe a little bit more complex. I don't know, Lucas, Mindy, um, do you guys oh, yeah, have I monitoring? So I'll, I'll talk a little bit. Uh, every single one of my classes, every single session, students go into a breakout group for 35 minutes to work on a, a problem set. So they have a Google Doc uh, in front of them and with clear specific instructions, problems that they have to solve, steps that they need to include. So throughout those breakout groups, they're working on this document together and the instructions are there. So I'm very lucky my platform that I work on has the ability to uh, see all of the groups at the same time. I can see all those Google Docs that's specific to, to my platform. Um, but visiting the groups is uh, really important. You can think about it that if you were in, in a regular brick and mortar setting, you couldn't also be seeing all of the groups at the same time, right? So there is that moving from one place to another that is going to happen online too. Uh, it's faster <laughs> and uh, you, can, you can move students around and you can move yourself around more efficiently. Um, but overall, the, the tips are those, to have clear instructions, a place uh, for students to, to put their notes, to put their thoughts, organize it, um, and then you visiting every once in a while uh, to see what's going on. Yeah, and I would definitely just echo what they've said. And just when you're working with these small groups, like like Lucas said, give them an, ob an objective. Like, this is what I want you to get out of this. Um, um, that's really super important. And then I kind of break it down as a time outline. Like for the first two minutes, I just want you to look at the problem and discuss it. And then I want, you know, like y you'll have a leader or someone that will be writing on a whiteboard and say, okay, this or on the, the document or whatever it is. And, um, you know, say for the next five minutes, I want you to work out this or however long it's going to take. And then we're going to come back together and we're going to discuss this. So they really know what, what outcome do you want from this? And I think that that's maybe the best way to work with it. Um, but yeah, definitely visiting those groups is helpful um, depending on how long your, uh, what, whatever your activity is. Mine generally aren't that long. It's, I need to keep my students really engaged and uh, short uh, attention spans happen. So um, that's kind of how I interact with those groups. Thank you. Safe? Thank you, everyone. Uh, please join me in thanking our speakers. This has been a fantastic discussion. Uh, thank you, Mindy. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Glenda. And thank you, Kirky, for moderating the questions. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, uh, before we let you go, we have uh, uh, a few resources that we are sharing. Um, again, this, this session is going to be recorded and we're going to share the link of the recording with all of you. Um, uh, MIT is developing a website for K through 12 teachers as well as higher ed uh, with resources that you can use during this time. Um, the uh, JOL library is where we're going to have the recording of this session. Uh, MIT, as well as other schools, have websites for supporting MIT teachers. At MIT, there is teachremote.mit.edu, has a lot of hints uh, and, and support supporting resources. Uh, open.mit.edu has a channel where uh, people are posting also uh, resources uh, that might be helpful. Um, Mindy also shared with us uh, a website for the Utah Education Network. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.